Hello, good evening. Welcome to Patchwork Central on a Sunday, sunny Sunday afternoon in July. Um, as folks are gathering, um, one of the pleasures of uh, joining a service like this on Facebook is seeing all the people who check in. So be sure that you do that in the comment section on Facebook. If you're with us live, check in with your name and a, and a greeting for the other folks who are here. Um, also, at the same time, add uh, gifts and prayer requests, and we'll lift those up later in the service. If this is your first time worshiping with us, um, we will, at the, toward the end of the service, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, and you are welcome to join us. We do this virtually, so you're invited at home to have a piece of bread or a cracker and to have juice or a little bit of wine, some water, and toward the end of the service, we'll all um, pull that together into a celebration of the Eucharist. Um, while folks continue to check in, remember that um, there are ongoing patchwork events. Um, Shade Tree Hospitality and the Food Pantry are open on Wednesday and Thursday mornings, and Sozo Health Ministry is also there at the same time, all outside. So put on your mask and um, know that, that that's happening. Um, let's see. Hmm. Okay. Few folks are signed in. Um, Karen is here. John is here. Darlene is here. Laura's here. Jane is here. Uh, I'm having a little trouble making my thing move. Sue Hazeltine is here. Gail Lafif, and I guess that would mean Bill. Robin Musgrave is here. Yes, okay. Well, so as we um, continue to gather, it is our tradition to celebrate um, anniversaries and birthdays early in the service. I looked on my calendar and there aren't any. So if you know of a birthday or a celebration that we should lift up, uh, include that in the comments and, and we'll try to get that in at an appropriate time a little bit later. So, welcome. Let's open by hearing the first few verses of Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. So this passage shares the joy of the psalmist who has found a place to meet God, a place where God dwells, um, altars where even the most vulnerable can find safety and comfort with God. So tonight we are going to celebrate that comfort and joy during our worship service. We began this last week when our opening was from Psalm 42. And in that Psalm, we heard the psalmist yearning desperately for a meeting with God, for an awareness of the presence of God. And we contrasted that active yearning, active searching, active wanting with the experience of the Old Testament patriarch Jacob. Jacob was not looking for God at all when God found him in a dream, in a vision, and a voice, and promises. And then we considered Jacob's response. He recognized that this encounter with God was something that needed to be marked. So he set up a stone, consecrated it with oil, and gave the place a new name, House of God. So, we turned to think of the places, the situations, the experiences that we might mark in our own lives, places I invited us to call our altars, where God, however we conceive of God, has met us, and where we might meet God again. 
Several of you responded to my invitation, and this week I'm going to pass along your sharing of the altars, those dwelling places of your understanding of God that you shared with me. You sent me stories, descriptions, and a poem, pictures of art and pictures of places, and links to music. Some of these are on a handout I emailed yesterday to as many of you as I expected might join us this evening. If you didn't get the handout, I'm sorry. I'll be doing the best that I can to fill in that gap during the service, but if afterwards you would like to see the handout, let me know and I can send it to you. I'll tell you how to do that at the end. Okay, so first, a word of thanks and homage to Barbara Brown Taylor, whose 2009 book, An Altar in the World, inspired these services. The book's title called up many thoughts and images for me before I even read it. And of course, Jacob's story came to mind, his commemoration of a meeting with God by erecting an altar in his own world at the place of that meeting a place where there had been nothing special before and where there might not be anything special for others after, but for Jacob, it became a holy place, a sacred set apart space. It wasn't a place identified by the equivalent of a church, a spiritual leader, a holy pilgrim or an ascetic. It wasn't a place designed to produce an experience of God. And Jacob wasn't doing anything intended to create an encounter with God. It was just the place and the moment in the world where Jacob was met by God. Taylor suggests that we may best discover God, or what she calls the something more that so many of us are looking for, in the ordinariness of our lives. In this case, for her, in practices. Practices like those that she uses as the chapter titles of her book. The practice of paying attention. The practice of getting lost. The practice of wearing skin. The practice of saying no. The practice of carrying water. Let me share with you one of Taylor's practice altars. It is the practice of pronouncing blessings. She acknowledges that she, an ordained minister, is paid to pronounce blessings on occasions of birth, death, and marriage for new homes, new endeavors, and public events. But it isn't the practice of pronouncing these blessings that she commends to her readers. It is something much less official. She offers a beginner's lesson in pronouncing blessings. Start with anything you like, she writes. Even a stick lying on the ground will do. The first thing to do is to pay attention to it. Did you make the stick? No, you did not. The stick has its own story. If you have the time to figure out what kind of tree it came from, that would be a good start to showing the stick some respect. Is it on the ground because it is old or because it suffered mishap? Has it been lying there for a long time, or did it just land? Is it fat enough for you to see its growth rings? If you look at the stick long enough, you are bound to begin making it a character in your own story. There's nothing wrong with these associations, except that they take you away from the stick and back to yourself. To pronounce a blessing on something, it is important to see it as it is. What purpose did this stick serve? Did a bird sit on it? Did it bear leaves that sheltered the ground from the hottest summer rain? Now, no one can hear you, she says, so you may say whatever you like. Bless you, stick, for being you. Blessed are you, O oh stick, for turning dirt and sun into wood. Blessed are you, Lord God, for using this stick to stop me in my tracks. Then Taylor offers several pieces of wisdom about pronouncing blessings. 
our blessing, any blessing, does not confer holiness. The holiness is already there, embedded in the givenness of the thing, because God made the being or the thing. It already shares in God's holiness. To pronounce a blessing on something is to see it from the divine perspective. To pronounce a blessing is to participate in God's initiative. To pronounce a blessing is to share God's own audacity. And she says, pronouncing blessings is a tailor that you and I can cultivate as a way of meeting and being met by God. Pronouncing a blessing, she says, puts us as close to God as one can get. To learn to look with compassion on everything that is, is to land at God's breast. So, that practice, the practice of pronouncing blessings, is one of Taylor's altars. Last week, I recalled for those of you who have worshiped regularly in person with us that we have occasionally shared, along with our names, some particular thing about ourselves that could help others know us better, more personally. So that's what I invited last week's worshipers to do, to share a story, an image, a description of a place, a relationship, a thing that has become, for them, an altar. And some of you did. <coughs> And I've been blessed by your sharing, and now I feel privileged to share your sharing, intended to be a sharing for us all. Robin sent a poem she wrote, one that she has already shared with many of us. My Backyard Altar. In the cool of the morning, with the first light dappling rosy through the trees, I go to my altar and sit on my porch swing pew the bird choir, blissfully unaware of the new normal, chirps, trills, and calls their hymns of praise, and my potted impatience answer, amen. All the while, the fresh breeze bouncing from ridge to valley is the very breath of God on my cheeks. Now, we'll see how this works. John shared two different kinds of altars. First, if you have the handout, you'll be able to see this better. First, a picture of his church office desk, about which John says, I sit at this desk and read, think, pray, struggle with writer's block, daydream, get inspired, meditate, get frustrated, talk to God, listen for God, and occasionally yell at God. Before the pandemic, I would also sit across this desk and talk with congregants or other visitors who needed counseling or a listening ear. I would often experience God that way too. It is a holy place for me, says John. The messy piles of books, papers, tissue boxes, harmonicas, pens, staplers, phone charger, soda cans, and other detritus of daily church life belie or perhaps indicate the sacred nature of my time spent there. And then John also sent a link to a piece of music, and I, the, the only thing I can do is refer you to the, um, the handout if, if you got it. The piece of music is called Big Country by the banjo player Bella Fleck. And about this, John said, I don't really have the words to describe how I feel when I listen to this piece of music. It is beautiful, haunting, wistful, melancholic, but ultimately hopeful and expansive. Those words still don't do it justice, though. It is ineffable, like the holy itself. You can listen to other versions and hear the distant, different voices and interpretations, how it almost becomes a completely different piece of music, much like the diversity of voices and interpretations of Scripture. from John. And Darlene shares this description of her altar. My altar is sitting in a garden early in the morning with the rainbow bows of brilliant colors of red, yellow, purple, orange, and pink flowers that God has made. With the sun shining brightly on the dew drops, like maybe the sparkle in God's eyes. As I sit back in my chair and close my eyes, I can hear the beautiful music of the birds that are singing 
As people are different, birds all sing differently, but together they sound like a choir from heaven, which makes the moment very calm and peaceful and very easy to talk to God. Robin, Robin with a Y, sent a picture of this at-home altar, which was the sanctuary where she and her husband, when they couldn't go to their church during Holy Week and the weeks after Easter, um, they worshiped here. The space, she says, continues to be the place where she meets God for her daily devotion, seeing through the window God's creation and being grateful for the mercies of the new day. Randy sent a picture of his picnic table altar in Harmony Park. And there's a story about how this place became special for him. On a Friday afternoon in mid-September of 2007, I took my guitar and a yellow legal pad to the park. I was flat broke. Because I was working on a 10-month teaching contract, my last paycheck was at the end of July. I would not get another until the end of September. I'd just gone through a tough divorce and my child support payment was due. I sat down at the table to write a song and the story of the feeding of the 5,000 came to me, probably because I was thinking about ways to turn my lack into abundance. The song Miracle almost wrote itself. I strummed a D chord and sang the lyrics but I broke down sobbing midway through. Randy sent a link to Miracle. You can listen to that um, on YouTube. I blubbered something like, God, despite my best efforts, I come to you broke and broken. All I have to offer you is this song, but it's yours if you'll have it. And now that I have your attention, I need $300 and I need it quickly. Thanks for listening. The story continues. When I returned to my car, I checked my phone messages. One of the messages was from the entertainment chairman of Kunstfest, New Harmony's annual fall festival. She said one of the acts she had booked had canceled and asked if I would be willing to fill in Saturday and Sunday for $150 a day. I returned the call and booked the gig. So Randy concludes by saying, I still go to that picnic table to write, play guitar, or talk to God. <clears throat> Laura sent two altars. Those of us who know her will not be surprised at the first and will perhaps agree that the second is very appropriate to the time we are living in now. Laura's first altar is the experience of joining with other people in congregational singing of familiar hymns. Amen. And secondly, she says, an altar is the encounter with friends who have given me help during this COVID-19 period by bringing me food, running errands for me, and answering my phone questions. Sean is a woman rich in altars. Uh, she sent few words, but an album of pictures. She says, my deck, my front porch, the lake, my office at Patchwork, my home, and the ocean, to name a few. These are Sean's altars. Karen sent a powerful picture and words to accompany it. The chapel at Valparaiso University never fails to evoke the presence of God. I could see God at work getting me to Valpo with a good scholarship and into a program that put me in conversation with some pretty amazing folks and taught me that faith and knowledge are not in opposition to each other. In that context, I discovered in time that I was doing theology in all of my humanities classes. 
In the chapel, I learned about how to do worship well, heard good preaching and astonishing music from the pipe organ and other instruments. As for myself, last week I told you about my porch. This evening I share two other of my altars. <clears throat> Over 30 years ago I was at a conference in Philadelphia and in some free time was wandering through the city's Museum of Art. I came around a corner in one of the galleries and was confronted by this huge painting over six feet by seven feet by Henry Osawa Tanner of the Annunciation. My heart leapt then and it still leaps today whenever I see this. Another of my altars is a piece of music. There's a link on the handout. Eight years ago, I spent two seasons undergoing chemotherapy for lymphoma. My sisters got together and assembled a collection of music to accompany through me through those months. One of the pieces in that collection was Highland Cathedral. If you listened on the handout, you will have heard Phil Coulter's piano version. There are a variety of other versions. Like John, I don't have words to describe my feelings when I listen to this music but I am almost always moved to tears. And finally, Amy sent a picture without words, letting the image speak for itself. I don't know how well you can see that. I hope at least a little bit. So these are the altars of some of us. My thanks to everyone who shared them with the rest of us. Mountains were very often altar places in the Bible. Moses went up Mount Sinai on behalf of the Israelites in the wilderness. There he met God and brought back the law. An angel instructed the prophet Elijah to go stand on Mount Horeb where the Lord would pass by. But, you remember, God was not in the great wind. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the fire. The voice of God came to Elijah in the sound of sheer silence on that mountain. Jesus himself often went out to the mountain to pray. On the other hand, for Saul, soon to become Paul, it wasn't a mountain, it wasn't even a seeking, but it was an ordinary, much-traveled road that became a surprise altar, a place of meeting God. This is from Acts. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. As Jesus often went to a mountain to pray, knowing that mountains were places where he had and would again meet God, so some of us return to those places that we have found will reliably bring our spirits in touch with a greater spirit. But also, like Paul, we are sometimes caught in the middle of something else, like traveling from where we've been to where we're going. Sometimes we're surprised to find that we are found and that something ordinary has suddenly become extraordinary, a sacred altar. May our lives be enriched by both kinds of altars. Amen. Now is our time for sharing gifts and prayers. And if you're with us live, I hope you've entered yours in the comments section. Let me just take a little look here. All right. <clears throat> In addition to lifting up the financial gifts 
that Patchwork continues to receive, even in these times of, that are financially precarious for so many. We also lift up the gift of yesterday's back to school sale, smooth and successful. Many school children now will be going back to school however they go, well supplied for their work for the year. We lift up the gift of the impending sale of 116 Washington, a project that has been seriously pursued for several months by several people, especially Stephanie Morris, a member of our board. We lift up the gift of John and Amy, who in addition to the work associated with preparing for the sale of 116, have been dealing with all the ordinary and special challenges <clears throat> that are keeping patchwork and patchwork programs open and operating in new ways for these new times. And we lift up the gift of Patchwork's continuing programs, Shade Tree Hospitality, Food Pantry, the Sozo Health Ministry. John, hmm, I think I'll save that for prayers. Sean lifts up the gift of her neighborhood and mentions that the practice of gratitude is essential for her. I think maybe that's part of the reason she has so many altars, is that she is such a very good gratitude practicer. So, remembering all of these gifts, we lift them up and we give God thanks. And now we turn to prayers. I will lead the prayers. When I say, gracious God, please join together and join the prayer by saying, hear our prayer. Gracious, loving, and ever listening God, we lift up in thanksgiving all the blessings we have named, as well as those we carry in our own hearts. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We give thanks for this community. Thanks for the many ways we care for and are cared for by each other, even at a distance. And tonight, for the way our community has been enriched, enriched and strengthened by our mutual sharing, even at a distance, of things personal and moving. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for Patchwork staff and volunteers as they have worked through a COVID exposure and especially for the staff member who is experiencing COVID symptoms. May that one's period of illness be mild and short, and may we all faithfully wear our masks. And we pray for all individuals and families as people are frightened by the prospect of serious illness, find themselves separated from friends and family in nursing homes or hospitals, even as some are near death. And now, especially for families, teachers, and school workers as they navigate the challenges and hazards posed by any decision about how children return to school in the next few weeks. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for Eastside Christian Church as it goes through a pandemic the lack of in-person worship, and the anticipation of closing as a congregation and sinking into the body of Christ universal. And we pray for John as he assists the folks at East Side on this journey. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for John and Amy as they begin next weekend a two-week time of respite and rejuvenation May they indeed find the rest they deserve and return newly invigorated and equipped for the work which lies ahead. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for the staff and volunteers who will carry on patchwork programs while Amy and John are away. May their commitment to their work be rewarded with success and satisfaction. And may we as community members reach out and care for each other. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for our city, our state, our nation, and our world. May our leaders make wise decisions, 
holding the least of the people and the regions of the earth to be as important as the greatest. Gracious God, hear our prayer. We pray for our democracy as violence continues and escalates in many of our nation's cities and as welcome or unwelcome federal troops become involved. Gracious God, hear our prayer. And now in a moment of silence, O oh God, hear as each of us lift up those prayers that we have not made public, but hold close to our hearts. All of this we pray in your holy name, amen. As we noted last week, for many of God's Christian people, this table, these elements, this meal we are about to share, and the community that sharing creates are an altar, a place where we may meet God. And for that reason, it is holy, set apart, a time, a place, a story that bring us life. We are separate in space and maybe even in time, but we gather in spirit to remember to share this meal, to make community. So we gather, I with this bread and cup here, you as you choose with your bread and your cup, wherever you are, to share together these gifts of God for the people of God. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread with his disciples. After giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. And now, even though we are apart, we are one community as we eat this bread and drink this cup together. Let us pray. Loving God, you have given us a share of the one bread and the one cup and made us one with each other and with Christ. Let us meet you at our altars and be refreshed and renewed for the days ahead. Amen. Finally, a few announcements. John and Amy's vacation does begin on August 1st. We will not be gathering for worship on the two Sundays that they are away. That would be about the second or third and the week after that. Um, we will not be gathering on Facebook. Jane Johansson will be facilitating a Sunday evening Zoom meeting. Look for more information, look for your invitation, and if you're not on our regular community mailing list but would like to be part of those meetings, uh, send an email to Amy amy at patchwork.org. And then a reminder, if you didn't get a copy of the handout for tonight's worship and with the pictures and the links to music, if you would like one, you can contact me at this pop-up email address. I'm going to take this down in about a week, but you can contact me at this email address and I would send you a copy of that, that handout. All right. I'm not aware of other announcements. So, as we prepare to separate and leave this virtual gathering place, we are reminded that we are bound together in spirit, that our God lifts us up through each day, 
and that we are the instruments of God's lifting up of others. Let the people of God say, Amen.